good morning or good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm going to share my screen as well. All right. Okay. So uh, yeah, my name is uh, uh, Kim Buebrun, and thank you for the invitation to uh, to, to present to, to all of you today. Uh, I work for the Northern Lights Joint Venture, which is uh, a collaboration between uh, the three companies, Shell, Equinor, and Total Energies. Uh, this company was established uh, about a year and a half ago uh, and uh, is doing carbon transport and storage on the Norwegian continental shelf. Uh, we are focused on transport and storage and not capture of CO2. So we offer the transport and storage services uh, to uh, industrial emitters uh, across Europe. Uh, we have a flexible value chain as such. And uh, uh, I'll go to, uh, to, to this slide first, just to uh, let you know that we had a summit uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, uh, where we invited many of our potential customers, the industrial emitters across Europe and policymakers to discuss where we are and what need to happen in order to make this a success. And the recording from that summit is available on our website if you're interested. There is also a summary uh, of the summit itself. But we are part of a larger project, a CCS full value chain project that was put together by the Norwegian government a couple of years ago meaning the work on this value chain started already in 2017, uh, but final investment decision by the companies involved and the Norwegian government was made uh, late 2020. And this full-scale project uh, that the Norwegian government has launched is called Longship, and it includes capture of CO2 from two industrial facilities in Norway. One, the Norsem cement production facility in Breivik in the Eastern Norway, which will capture 400,000 tons of CO2. And uh, the um, uh, Celsio waste to energy facility in Oslo, which previously used to be called Fortum Oslo Varme, um, but they have now changed name to Celsio. They will also capture 400,000 tons of CO2 uh, from uh, the incineration of waste at their facility. Uh, and they also have a significant component of negative emissions uh, in the process. But Northern Lights and the Northern Lights Joint Venture is not involved in the capture. We will take CO2 from these two facilities, transport it to a receiving terminal that we are currently building in Øygarden on the western side of Norway and permanently store the CO2 in a reservoir which is 2,600 meters deep and 100 kilometers offshore in the North Sea. The CO2 will be stored in this geological form formation uh, uh, and it will be safely stored there uh, for eternity. And we are obviously subject to regulations, both European and Norwegian regulations, the European Storage Directive and uh, relevant Norwegian regulations that do regulate exactly how we go about uh, this activity. And I can, can come back to that later. I wanted to, to show you some photos. And uh, uh, this first photo is an overview of the onshore facilities in Aigan that we are currently constructing. This is a construction site, so it's not ready. But you will see that uh, uh, this is happening. It's not just on the drawing board. Final investment decision was taken uh, in 2020 and uh, we immediately started the activities uh, uh, both on this onshore facility, but also offshore. And uh, uh, what you see here is, first of all, the administration building and visitor center, 
that will be completed uh, uh, actually in October this year and uh, officially opened. Uh, the uh, rest of the facilities will be ready mid-2024. And uh, you will see the jetty uh, where we will receive CO2 that, uh, uh, that will be shipped to us from the industrial emitters. And uh, the jetty is ready. Uh, loading arms are yet to be installed. Uh, and there will also be a pipe rack uh, taking the CO2 to, to this area here where the storage tanks will be, temporary storage tanks will be installed. And uh, then uh, there will be a pipeline going through a tunnel, uh, which is currently being drilled. Uh, the tunnel will take the pipeline out into the fjord. Uh, and uh, from there, the pipeline will go offshore. 100 kilometers offshore to the exploitation license, as it's called, 001, which is the first license for storage of CO2 that has been awarded on the Norwegian continental shelf. Since then, another license has been awarded, and a third one is likely to be awarded later this year. So the uh, onshore facilities are. Uh, uh, going to be ready mid 2024 as the rest of the value chain and we are on time and on budget with the development which is really positive the capacity for the development the first phase of the development is one and a half million tons per year and we will take 400,000 tons from the two facilities i mentioned earlier norsem cement in breivik and celsio in oslo and uh, we will have spare capacity in phase one, which will be uh, uh, sold to industrial emitters. And we are currently in conversations with a number of uh, interested parties uh, uh, in Europe and hope to be able to sign our first commercial contract later this year. But we are also looking at expanding the capacity of the facilities to between five and seven million tons. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Here are, uh, uh, I'll show you a couple of more photos. Here we, we see a close up of the administration building and visitor center. And once it's opened, uh, then you are more than welcome to, to come visit us. Uh, one of the things that we want to do, uh, and which is a, a, a very important part of what we're doing, uh, is to share knowledge and experience. Because Northern Lights cannot be the first and only facility of this kind. We need many more. And CCS uh, is, as we see it, a very important climate mitigation technology. And we see a close up of the area where the storage tanks are going to be installed. Uh, and we expect the storage tanks to, to arrive at site in uh, uh, first quarter of 2023. So this is, uh, this is the, the, the foundation. And here we see the storage tanks themselves. They are currently being put together and fabricated in Spain and will be transported to uh, the Northern Lights uh, onshore facilities in Q1 2023, as I mentioned. And there are 12 of these storage tanks that will be installed. And this is temporary storage, obviously. So. Uh, CO2 will be offloaded from the vessels, then it will be temporarily stored before it's being injected through the pipeline and into the storage reservoir. And the reason that we have this temporary storage capacity is that we do not want a kind of start-stop type injection into the reservoir. We want a steady flow of CO2, and we also want to quickly offload the vessels so that they can move on and pick up CO2 again uh, uh, from, from our customers. Uh, and, and that way we will be able to quickly offload the CO2 from the vessels, store it temporarily on shore while continuously injecting into the reservoir through the pipeline. And here we see a close up of the tunnel that is currently being drilled. Uh, this is where the, the pipeline will come up. And uh, uh, the 
pipeline itself is 100 kilometer long. Uh, this particular tunnel is uh, uh, approximately 700 meter long. It will take the pipeline into the fjord. Uh, and from there, it will be laying on the uh, sea bottom. Uh, um, but it will be covered by, by gravel uh, and, and standard procedures are being followed in, in terms of how to do that. There are obviously lots of, of pipelines, both on the Norwegian continental shelf and elsewhere, and uh, established procedures uh, for, for that. And here we see the, the, uh, the, the, the pipeline. Uh, it's been fabricated in Italy and transported to Orkangar in mid-Norway, where it's going to be Put together uh, and uh, coated, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, of, of pipes, obviously, um, for a 100 kilometer long pipeline. Um, so this is a uh, a, a complex uh, uh, operation that will be undertaken, uh, laying the pipeline. The the pipeline laying process uh, will start. Uh, I think in Q2 next year. And here we see the uh, the uh, subsea template. This is one of two templates that have already been installed uh, on the bottom of the sea uh, uh, in the uh, uh, at the exact location where we uh, have drilled a first injection well and where we going to drill a second injection well. That second well will be drilled uh, in, in, in this summer, uh, starting in August this year. And uh, uh, these are large structures, obviously, um, as you can see, um, but a very important component of the, the infrastructure. Here we see uh, uh, on a, a spool, the uh, umbilical, you can't see the umbilical itself, but there will be an umbilical that will be um, uh, containing all the uh, systems that are needed in order to, to operate the wells, the injection wells. Uh, so uh, uh, these umbilicals are, uh, are going to be installed later this year. Here's another photo of the uh, facilities in Aigon in, in slightly uh, grayer uh, weather than, than the first photo that we saw. Um, but it's, it's a little bit more close up. So, so you will see there is a lot of activity uh, going on right now, uh, getting the, the, the various components ready uh, for the start of uh, injection in 2024. We are also building two ships as part of this value chain. Uh, and the shipping component is very important. Uh, and this, uh, the ships have basically contributed, or that the ship-based transportation of CO2 is contributing to uh, uh, the flexibility that, uh, uh, that we are providing through our value chain. Meaning that we do not need a direct link between the source and the sink. The uh, uh, emitters will be able to capture their CO2 and we can pick it up from wherever they are uh, located. Uh, that means that we can therefore take CO2 from a number of different countries in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, storage capacity is unevenly distributed. Uh, the storage capacity is mainly in a handful of countries in Europe. Industrial emitters in countries that do not have their own storage capacity will be de dependent on either a pipeline connection from their facilities to uh, wherever storage capacity is being developed, or they can rely on a ship-based transport solution. And that is what we are providing. This is what the receiving terminal is going to look like uh, uh, once it's ready. Um, the first phase development 
with capacity to take one and a half million tons per year. You will see the administration building and vista center, workshop, substation, injection pumps, storage tanks, pipeline into a tunnel. Uh, and uh, this area has been prepared for future expansion. There is also an import jetty, of course. But we uh, are also looking at expansion of the facilities. And uh, uh, here you see an illustration of what an expanded facility would look like with additional storage tanks and uh, a second jetty, uh, which will be suitable for larger ships. The ships that we are now building uh, will have capacity to take 7,500 meters uh, cubic meters. Uh, that amounts to approximately 8,000 tons of CO2 per shipload. Uh, we are looking at also building larger ships so that we can take uh, uh, volumes uh, uh, up to maybe 12,000 cubic meters. As part of, of uh, the second development phase, we will also drill additional wells. We have drilled one so far, we'll drill another one uh, this summer. Uh, that's for phase one. And then we are looking at three additional wells for phase two. And the phase two studies that we're currently doing, because we haven't made final investment decision on uh, the phase two development yet, uh, that will happen uh, most likely early next year. But the study that we are currently undertaking is co-financed by the Connecting Europe Facility Program of the European Union. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about why uh, uh, we see a need for development of storage capacity uh, uh, in Europe. And uh, I'll focus mainly on Europe uh, in, in what I'm gonna talk about here. These slides have been taken from a study that has been done by Rista Energy. Rista Energy has done this on our behalf. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's paid for by us uh, and therefore uh, I'm uh, able to, to utilize these slides, but unfortunately, unfortunately I can't share, it, uh, share these slides with you later. But I'll try to, to take you through uh, the key elements here. And uh, also uh, at the summit that we did a couple of weeks ago, uh, and the link that is available on our website, you will hear Rista Energy talking about this themselves. Uh, they're obviously the ones that have done the studies, so, so they are uh, better at, uh, at explaining uh, uh, all the different elements here, but I'll try my best as well. Uh, here we see uh, the global CO2 emissions in 2019, 37.5 gigatons. Then we see the non-European emissions. And here we have the European emissions, 3.3 gigaton. So that is the same as 3.3 uh, billion tons of CO2. Then if we focus on the European emissions, 3.3 gigaton, then we see that most of these emissions are linked to either buildings, so that could be heating of uh, uh, buildings. Uh, and then we have about one gigaton that is from transportation, all type of transportation, uh, including uh, air transportation and aviation, but also um, um, vehicles and, and, and other transportation modes. Then we have 1.2, which is linked to power and industrial activities. And then we have 0.3, which is linked to gas power. And then we have what we are focusing on uh, for uh, our activities, the hard to abate industrial sectors. And if we have a closer look at the hard to abate sectors, what we find here is the cement industry, the waste industry, refineries, ammonia, 
biomass, petrochemical industries, gas power, and steel and aluminium. These are sectors that do not, uh, or where it's very hard to kind of reduce the overall emissions without CCS. They have a strong dependency on CCS to decarbonize. So that's why we call them the hard to abate sector. So for example, in the cement industry, the emissions are mainly caused by uh, the fact that they are using raw materials in production of cement, uh, which contains CO2. So when the limestone is being crushed, CO2 is being released. And the uh, same with, for example, uh, well, other sectors, waste to, to uh, uh, the, the waste industry uh, is basically, the emissions here are basically linked to, 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 to the incineration of waste. And I think we can probably all agree that we don't want to go back to landfills. Uh, incineration of waste is, is probably um, uh, what we're gonna uh, continue doing. And for that reason, we need to capture these emissions, but there is, is a, a significant amount of residual heat in the incineration process that can be utilized. And that is already happening in many countries uh, uh, across Europe. Um, uh, and, and that is why we can say that through uh, incineration of waste uh, or waste to energy processes, we will have uh, a component of negative emissions. Then, and here you see cement and waste represent large and uh, the most robust sectors for carbon capture. Um, but um, uh, we and but we have also the the, the other sectors: refineries, ammonia, biomass, etc. And 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 we see uh, all of them listed here and uh, uh, the emissions that they represent. And emissions from these sectors will be increasing if alternative solutions lag behind, which will mean that will, there will be an increased need for CCS for the hard to abate industries. But there is a net zero pathway um, and uh, uh, the goal would be to capture in Europe about 110 million tons per annum of hard to abate emissions by 2030. Northern Lights, as I said, will do one and a half uh, million ton uh, uh, in 2024. We hope to increase that to between five to seven million tons, but we need much more storage capacity. And Northern Lights cannot be the only storage operator. We need uh, development of storage capacity in Europe. But um, uh, by 2050, uh, uh, well, 2035 first, and then 2050, obviously, we will need much more than just 110. So the key focus for the European Commission is to continue to develop storage capacity. And uh, uh, that is, uh, uh, going to be important because storage capacity, not only because we, we um, uh, well, obviously we need CCS, uh, we, we realize that st storage capacity is unevenly distributed in Europe. The storage capacity is mainly concentrated around the North Sea Basin, whilst you see that emitters are spread across Europe. And here we see that, um, uh, that about 85% of point source emissions are feasible for CCS. And we see in this overview that uh, uh, we have mapped those that are less than 50 kilometers from a river or the coast, uh, or that represent five megatons of CO2 or more in a 50, uh, square kilometer cluster. And that covers 85% of emissions that are therefore feasible for CCS. 
Here you see the CCS projects that are under either planning or development in Europe today. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, this is important. This is good, but we need many more such projects. And we see the announced startup here from 24 to 29 and the source. Gas refinery, cement, steel, ammonia, hydrogen, biomass, chemical represented here. See if I can um, can take this away. It doesn't seem to be possible. Well, anyway, um, this uh, uh, slide shows uh, the capacity, uh, storage capacity that is being um, uh, being developed. So, uh, offshore CO two injection capacity in Europe, uh, and it's um, uh, as you see. Uh, relatively uh, little capacity being developed right now, um, but there are plans for development of more capacity and uh, we see that it's coming on stream. Um, but it needs to um, uh, accelerate uh, quite quickly in order for us to be able to, to move as quickly as we want. Um, and um, uh, uh, we will see that um, uh, we need more than, than 100 million tons by 2035. Uh, there is potential to, to get much more capacity than that uh, developed. That's the risk capacity. And then we have to factor in delays, cancelled projects, and ramp up time as well. So it, it does take time. Um, but that obviously assumes that the projects that are uh, in feed phase are actually uh, being developed. And uh, here we see Northern Lights, uh, the capacity that we are developing, one and a half million tons at first and then uh, ramping up. And we see other projects that are currently also being developed Photos, for example, is going to be an important one, uh, and there are a number of others. So uh, the capacity is being developed, uh, and it needs to, to happen quickly. Uh, uh, the uh, challenge, uh, obviously, is that, uh, uh, that it takes time. And uh, uh, here we see. Um, uh, that there is a significant gap. Uh, here we see the, the capture targets and here we see the storage capacity uh, that is being developed. So there are uh, uh, quite a, uh, a few capture or uh, let's say industrial emitters that are looking at CCS and several have received support either from their national governments or from the EU Innovation Fund. Uh, but uh, there is not enough storage capacity being developed. So we need to, to accelerate that development. Uh, and here we see the risk uh, annual injection capacity, uh, hard to abate capture target for, for meeting net zero in 2050. So, um, uh, implicit hard to abate capture target in line with net zero pathway is what we're seeing here. And then the storage capacity, the risk storage capacity that we see being developed. Uh, there is also a gap here. So that also needs to be, to be covered. But um, storage is a, a, a bottleneck. Uh, there are, uh, the storage capacity is mainly available uh, in the Norwegian part of the North Sea. In the, on the British side of the North Sea, and uh, then uh, Denmark and Netherlands. There is also some storage capacity available in Germany, um, but it doesn't look like that is going to be developed. So we have to, to then probably rely on the North Sea Basin area. 
And uh, uh, here we see the uh, offshore injection capacity uh, uh, in Europe in 2035 from long-term ambitions to risk estimate and remaining volumes. You see in the UK, um, they have significant ambitions and uh, uh, some capacity is being developed, but there is a gap. Same thing in Norway, uh, a gap between the ambitions and the actual kind of uh, projects that have been launched, not necessarily made FID on those projects, and uh, the same thing in the Netherlands. And uh, here we see uh, for rest of Europe, the same thing. So there is a gap between ambitions and capacity being developed. And that is a challenge and why we need to, uh, to see many projects like the Northern Lights uh, being launched over the coming years. Um, So let's see if I, uh, because we can't see the, the, the headline here. So I'm trying to, to remove this thing, but uh, okay. Um, no, not possible. So uh, what I want to focus on here is the, the, the policy recommendations. Uh, in order for this capacity to be developed, we need uh, incentives. Uh, there need to be incentives for development of infrastructure and investment in infrastructure through funding schemes and taxation. We see that partly already. Uh, the EU Innovation Fund is uh, mainly focused on capture projects, but there are the Connecting Europe Facility Scheme uh, that is focused on infrastructure. Um, but uh, uh, not enough uh, focus on CCS through that scheme just yet, but hopefully we will see uh, uh, that coming in, in the coming years. We need to speed up the acreage awards and permit approval process. The regulatory process here is new, both to the companies that are involved in development of this capacity, but also new for the regulators. So therefore the, the permit approval process uh, has been uh, somewhat slow and complex so far. But we're seeing in Norway that, uh, uh, that uh, it's uh, improving a lot. And uh, uh, we see now with the award of a second license that happened earlier this year, not to Northern Lights, but to another operator and a third license that is likely to be awarded later this year uh, that they are speeding up the acreage award and the approval process, and that's really good. Then we need uh, flexibility in terms and conditions of permits and licenses. We also need bilateral agreements between the exporting country and the importing country. Uh, when CO2 is being transported across borders, then it's subject to the London Protocol, CO2 is considered waste. And uh, uh, the London Protocol regulates uh, transportation of waste cross borders. And it, the parties to the London Protocol uh, has agreed that, um, uh, uh, that uh, uh, CO2 uh, should be and can be transported uh, uh, cross borders uh, from an exporting to an importing country. Uh, however, uh, the Article 6.2, which covers this particular uh, uh, issue, has not been ratified by all the signatories to the London Protocol. And for that reason, uh, in 2019, a kind of temporary solution was agreed upon by the signatories to the London Protocol, whereas uh, uh, the exporting country and the importing country need to, among other things, enter into a bilateral agreement uh, uh, on how to uh, go about uh, all the um, practicalities. 
uh, linked to, uh, to, to cross-border CO2 transportation. These bilateral agreements doesn't exist yet. The Norwegian government is in dialogue with a number of other European nations, uh, and we believe that we will see the first bilateral agreements being signed later this year. There is not only, it's not only the Norwegian government that is active in this space, also in Denmark, Belgium, uh, Netherlands, UK, uh, the governments are uh, uh, involved in uh, discussions on uh, bilateral agreements, uh, which basically ne need to be in place before we can uh, can 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 uh, start taking CO2 uh, from European countries into Norway, for example. Then um, uh, there is a bill there saying introduce ETS rewards for negative emissions uh, and invest in infrastructure such as harbor facilities and pipelines. Uh, I think uh, that could definitely help make it easier for industrial emitters across Europe to export CO2. You know, once they've captured the CO2, if they have a harbor facility where they can take the CO2 and where it can be exported, uh, then obviously that will simplify things for uh, uh, the, the emitters themselves. We could also imagine a situation where uh, hubs are being developed and, and, and that uh, hubs like this are already uh, uh, being planned at various locations in, in Europe. And then we need to standardize and simplify regulatory requirements. So uh, that's what I wanted to, to cover. Um, uh, then I'm happy to take any questions you, you may have. Thank you, Kim. If anyone has questions specifically for Kim, we can take them now and then we can move to the panel discussion. So we have a few questions from Lee. He's saying, thank you for the very informative presentation. Do you have any idea what proportion of CO2 emissions generated uh, this single storage facility will service? What are the key physical constraints for locating such a, a facility? Geography, geology, transport links, et cetera. And would access to the coast be essential for such projects? Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, of volumes, I think I I already mentioned that in in the first development phase we will be able to handle 1.5 million tons, uh, and we're looking at five to seven in the second development phase. And whether there will be a third uh, phase is 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 something that we we uh, we don't know yet. But uh, but that's obviously also possible. Uh, so uh, that's our capacity, but then we need other uh, uh, operators or storage operators to, to also develop capacity on their side. And we see that uh, uh, in the Netherlands and also in Norway, there are uh, companies that are uh, now looking at developing capacity uh, uh, up to 20 million tons each. There is also uh, discussions on building a pipeline uh, uh, between Europe and Norway uh, with capacity of between uh, 20 to 40 uh, million tons per annum. In terms of uh, storage capacity offshore, so what we know is that on the Norwegian continental shelf, uh, there is approximately, uh, a, a, well, a theoretical storage capacity of approximately 80 gigatons. Uh, and uh, if we estimate that the Norway sits on about one third of the European storage capacity, then uh, there would also be uh, another 80 gigatons in the UK. Uh, and the last third would be distributed between other European countries like the Netherlands and Denmark mainly. Uh, so there is significant storage capacity and I don't believe that storage capacity will be uh, a, 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 a problem. Uh, uh, in fact, I, I, I believe that the challenge is to develop that storage capacity quickly enough. Uh, the physical constraints for locating such a facility, well, there are various ways in this can be done. So we have decided to build this onshore receiving terminal. Uh, we don't necessarily need an onshore receiving terminal. We could also uh, uh, imagine 
uh, a development where the CO2 is injected directly from an offshore facility. And uh, that is a concept that is being looked at both by developers in Norway and also in Denmark. Uh, so the way we have done it, I mean, Northern Lights is not a perfect solution, but the way we look at it is that we can't wait for the perfect solution. We need to get going. And therefore there will be uh, kind of improvements made as we move along. But, you know, as we see it, uh, an onshore receiving terminal and a controlled injection through a pipeline um, uh, is, is our preferred way of, uh, of doing this. Uh, in terms of, uh, of geology, um, uh, yeah, uh, there are uh, uh, depleted oil and gas fields that could be used for storage of CO2, um, but we are using saline, uh, a saline aquifer. So saline aquifers have never contained oil and gas uh, uh, and uh, uh, are basically sandstone reservoirs, porous sandstone reservoirs uh, that uh, 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 that we can utilize for injection of the CO2. Uh, we are also dependent on a cap rock uh, on top of that storage um, uh, reservoir above the saline aquifer in order to hold uh, the, the CO2 type. Just uh, above our storage uh, reservoir, we have a 75 meter thick layer of shale. And uh, shale is a very solid cap rock in this context. Uh, in fact, there are other geological formations also uh, between the shale and another cap rock uh, uh, further uh, uh, further up in the rest of, uh, or in the the in the structure that we're looking at. Uh, uh, so we have basically two solid seals uh, 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 protecting uh, uh, the uh, any migration upward migration of CO two. Uh, and these are the same type of structures that uh, are utilized for um, uh, that, that geologists are looking for when they are trying to find oil and gas resources or hydrocarbon resources. Uh, because oil and gas will then have been trapped uh, uh, underneath um, uh, these uh, similar type of structures for millions of years. And uh, uh, that is kind of uh, evidence enough for the fact that this is a safe storage location. Obviously, uh, all storage or potential storage uh, reservoirs need to be tested. Uh, and there are also very strict uh, regulations on uh, monitoring of uh, uh, these reservoirs and uh, the migration patterns within the reservoirs. Uh, and then um, uh, you ask, would, would access to the coast sea be essential? Well, I think I answered that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think maybe I, I covered everything in, in that particular all. question. So I'll just ask you a few more, a bundle of a few questions that came up, and then we'll move to the panel discussion. When is, how do you ensure that the CO2 received and injected is free from contamination? Then checking, uh, I'll just bundle three questions so that you can answer them. And then another one from Roger about fracking raising concerns about introducing geological instabilities. Are there similar problems with CO2 storage as there are for fracking? And then about the cost being a significant factor. Uh, is today the cost being absorbed by the industries themselves or is it considered a government cost? Yeah, um, so the, the first question there, how to ensure that CO2 received and injected is free from any contamination. So the CO2 will, uh, we have strict um, uh, specifications on, uh, uh, on, on uh, or CO2 specifications. So it's CO2 need to, to meet those specifications in order for us to be able to receive it. Uh, so that means that before it's loaded on board our ships, uh, uh, it will be tested and that will, will, will ha happen every time for every shipload. Uh, it's important that these specifications are met, that the CO2 is, is pure. Uh, uh, pure meaning 
95% um, period. That means that we take out any humidity, we take out uh, uh, chemical components like mercury and other things, uh, and, and, and that is to protect our infrastructure. So uh, CO2 is uh, normally very corrosive, and for that reason, we obviously need to use other type materials or you know, uh, better quality type steel um, uh, in our infrastructure. Um, but, um, um, but we also want the CO2 to be as pure as possible in order to, to protect the infrastructure. Um, and then the question about fracking. So yeah, fracking raises many concerns about introducing geological instability. So we're not doing any, any fracking here. We are using saline aquifers. Uh, and saline aquifers are basically, it's sandstone, porous sandstone and CO2 will be injected into this sandstone. So there, there will be no need for, for, for any type of fracking. So that's, that's not really, really an issue here. Um, the cost, yeah, the, 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 this value chain is, um, uh, is expensive, of course, um, um, but our goal is to, to be competitive to any other uh, decarbonization uh, options. So uh, we need to, to keep cost under control. Uh, that's very important for us. Uh, we need to offer you know, cost-effective uh, uh, transportation solutions. And transportation is a very expensive part of the overall infrastructure. Uh, we believe that, um, uh, that the cost of both capture, transport, and storage of CO2 uh, will um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, not exceed uh, the estimated ETS in 2030. So the emission trading scheme uh, that is in place in Europe today, the EU ETS, uh, is basically consists of allowances that are awarded uh, to industrial emitters, um, uh, and then a need for additional, um, uh, uh, any additional emissions you would need to, to purchase um, uh, emission allowances. Uh, so there is a component of free allowances and, and then uh, allowances that need to be purchased. And uh, the number of free allowances are uh, uh, going down year by year. And uh, that means that uh, the costs uh, of purchasing allowances in the market is also going up. So right now, the uh, cost of purchasing an ETS allowance is approximately 85 euros. And uh, scenarios say that it is likely to be between 100 and 120 by 2030. And uh, we believe that the costs of capture, transport, and storage uh, will be uh, at that similar level uh, by 2030. But, um, uh, but there will be until then, and maybe also after then, uh, an, a need for uh, government support subsidies. In the Netherlands, for example, they have a contract for different type scheme, um, uh, which I uh, like a lot. Uh, which is basically means that uh, that uh, the, the Dutch government will cover the difference between the ETS price at any given time uh, and the actual cost uh, of uh, uh, of utilizing this technology. Thank you, Kim. So I'll now introduce our discussion panel, so we can start the discussion. We have Brian Van Harrison, founder and executive director of Climate Foundation, that's working with marine permaculture technology for carbon capture and regeneration of the seas. Then we have Paul Streifenieder, and I hope I didn't, didn't say your name. It was correct. Great, thank you. So he's working with Permafrost Foundation. It's more about uh, mitigating uh, carbon release and not as much capture. 
but he's going to explain it a bit better. And then we have Benjamin Taylor, managing partner at Red Quadrant, a public sector consultant. And he's also been working in systems thinking and systems change for over 15 years with the Cybernetics Society and other organizations. So uh, you can also introduce yourselves a bit before we start. And then I have a few questions to start the discussion. So we can start with Brian, please. Yes, greetings. Um, from the hinterlands of the Sunshine Coast of Queensland, Australia, Jinibara Territory. Um, very happy to join you from Australia. We've been working to uh, regenerate the kelp forests. And uh, in complement to what uh, Kim has described for you in terms of getting to net zero, uh, once we do that, we have um, a, a debt, if you will, to the planet of roughly 1,500 gigatons of carbon dioxide anthropogenically emitted over the last two centuries. And techniques like marine permaculture can ensure food security, it can help to regenerate ecosystems in the ocean, and we should be able to measure the carbon export eventually by the gigaton of um, seaweed as it grows, um, some 20% or more falls uh, from the platforms a thousand meters a day to the abyssal seafloor where it remains for centuries before outcropping again in remote parts of the ocean. So these multi-century to millennial timescales represent a true blue carbon sink that we are confident we'll be able to replicate what nature has been doing for eons, and that is using the marine biological pump to ensure um, that it works smoothly. Um, essential to that is uh, natural upwelling. Uh, the warming that we've seen is uh, curtailing that upwelling, and we're using endogenous renewable energy to restore natural upwelling and ensure that nature gets back on track in the oceans. So that's it in a nutshell. Back to you. Thank you, Brian. Now, Paul, please. Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. And as you said, um, Tiago, I'm working for the Pleistocene and Permafrost Foundation here in Germany. Um, we have a very important partner that I always have to introduce in Russia and as well um, a newly partner in Alaska, because there are these permafrosts. Um, these permafrosts containing a lot of carbon. Um, it's actually twice as much that we have in our atmosphere right now. So we can estimate around 1,600 gigatons in them, those um, permafrost soils. And we basically try to protect them or as preserved and as good as we can um, through an interesting um, rewilding approach. So also um, we have a nature-based solution here right now. And what we are doing um, with this um, rewilding approach that we basically try to recreate an ecosystem that was uh, there before um, during the ice age. We introduce um, animals like bisons, we introduce animals like musk ox, um, and maybe also um, the mammoth, you might see it in the news, um, the mammoth got great uh, attraction there, but that's, that's for the future and it's not really our job. And what um, this rewilding approach is doing is basically there to cool down the soils again and to pre preserve them till, um, to, to a certain standpoint and to keep this um, carbon into the soils. We have two other benefits there. We have some sort of carbon capture that I might go into depth um, later on again. And obviously we have a biodiversity that um, is recreated and has got this really resilience and um, safety on the permafrost itself. So that's really um, in a nutshell right now and go back to you again. Thank you, Paul. Uh, now, Benjamin, please can you introduce yourself? Thanks, Diogo. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. Um, well, I should start by saying that I feel very um, out of my depth with these uh, experts on the topic on the panel. Um, I am no kind of expert in carbon capture. Um, and I guess one of the things about being um, deeply involved in um, systems complexity cybernetics uh, as I am is that you hesitate to call yourself an expert at all. <laughs> but I really know nothing about carbon, but I do know something um, about systems thinking, systems change, systems leadership. Um, I'm running a workshop tonight um, for a couple of hours at 6 p.m. UK time for those who are interested um, and I'm here to learn um, and also to see what if anything the systems um, approaches can add into this conversation. Thank you Benjamin. So I'll start with a few questions we have prepared. Uh, first is uh, and this is for everyone so you can you can answer and discuss between yourselves at will. 
One is, do you think that carbon capture technologies are enough to mitigate uh, climate change and reach the current targets? Or do we need other solutions, such as a reduction in consumption globally, in your opinion, to meet the, our targets? Um, also, what do you suggest um, about possible solutions and approaches to, to solve the climate change problem? Are nature-based solutions easier to scale compared to CCS? Uh, and you can talk a bit about the scalability of each of the solutions. Uh, what are the benefits and risks to the environment and society in general? And because some carbon capture, especially if we want to have negative emissions, can take some time to have an effect, uh, do you think that can that postpone the consumption reduction that is necessary eventually to meet targets? especially if we rely on it to reach targets uh, in time. So anyone to start? Otherwise I'll, I, Brian, please. Sure. So I think answering the first question of decarbonization, I think Kim illustrated the case very accurately when just looking at the EU, you're looking at three gigatons of carbon emission, carbon dioxide emissions, of which 90 plus percent are abatable. And so I think we need to decarbonize on that order of 90 percent. And then, of course, um, CCS the rest. And then furthermore, we use carbon removals like uh, marine permaculture that we're developing at the Climate Foundation to begin to draw down the reservoir of 1,500 gigatons in the atmosphere and restoring it to the ocean where there's some 38,000 gigatons uh, today naturally stored. And it is highly scalable because uh, we've got between you and me right now, probably hundred million square kilometers of mostly empty ocean that's accessible to techniques like marine permaculture to provide substrate and deep water irrigation to seaweed forests and enable the natural capture of, um, of carbon as has been occurring for eons. Um, just to answer one of your other questions as well, um, some of the societal benefits are, how are we gonna address food security for close to 10 billion people on a, on a climate disrupted planet? Well, it turns out the ocean can be part of the solution. Uh, food security, you know, there's more than a billion people who depend on the oceans for their primary sustenance today. And yet we've collapsed so many fisheries and now are collapsing um, over 3000 square kilometers of kelp forest already, already gone. So the challenge and the opportunity is to uh, regenerate those natural kelp forests, the seaweed forests, and even microalgae forests, if you will, that provide habitat and food for these forage fishes and regenerate uh, sardine populations, uh, salmon, um, the anchovies, the herring. Um, all of these populations can be regenerated using techniques like marine permaculture. It's all about habitat and food supply and restoring natural upwelling being disrupted uh, by the climate changes. So um, that's a key part. Uh, and then finally, we should be able to measure carbon export uh, while we're ensuring that food security. And it scales beautifully because there's so much empty ocean to work with. And uh, any depths greater than 100 meters depth are um, accessible to marine permaculture. So we're very optimistic. We just need to build the will to scale this quickly enough to uh, get the kind of gigaton scale We've got a plan that triples the area under deep water irrigation every year for the next dozen years. And that reaches uh, one gigaton of um, carbon sink uh, in the middle of the next decade. Back to you. Thank you, Brian. Forward to the next. Yeah, I wanted to also, first of all, Brian, I completely agree with you um, that we can use the nature and should use nature for our solution to um, climate change. Obviously, Kim, I also agree with you that um, technology is also very important there and we can also obviously use it there. Um, from my standpoint, what I see there is that we drastically underestimate um, that biodiversity and climate change are really an independent um, system. So we can't really separate climate change and don't really um, look at biodiversity itself. We always have to include these two together because we can really easily use biodiversity and better diversity and conserve biodiversity to tackle climate change. And um, obviously it's, um, it's really easy for, for our standpoint to reintroduce animals and they basically do their job. They run around, they try to get food 
they just um, um, re reproduce and get more and more. And so we have an easy solution to permafrost um, thawing. So what I think that we basically have to use biodiversity way more, do these natural solutions way more. And as Brian said, this is really easy to scale up. We have empty oceans on our side. When you look to Russia, you have vast lands that are empty without any people there, maybe some settlements and, and that's it. So you can easily um, introduce huge amounts of animals and huge amount of parks. It's come becomes difficult when we talk about financing. So how do we really get a profit out of this? How do we really get a revenue stream that is um, sustainable? That's really hard for us to um, to look at right now. We looked at carbon credits, but that's always not the best solution for us. And um, maybe can and can go deeper into that later. But it's our standpoint that we have to use nature in order to tackle climate change. It's easy to be scalable, but for us, it's pretty hard to um, finance right now. Thank you, Paul. Benjamin? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, uh, it's really um, great to hear um, Paul say that because I think it is really important to recognize the interindependency of biodiversity and, and climate change. Um, and and one, of the, one of the nuggets that's always stuck with me um, in this space is that when the Club of Rome um, did their um, modeling to publish um, the limits to growth uh, model um, uh, 50 years ago, I think, is that right? Or 70 years ago? Um, I'm losing track. They um, focused primarily on um, carbon uh, cycles, partly because that was the most obvious thing. And, you know, the, the, other, the other interesting thing in looking at the research is that as early as the 1820s, we were looking at the, the, the regulation of the Earth's temperature by um, the atmosphere. But they also um, originally started to look at water cycles um, as part of the Earth's um, temperature regulation mechanisms. The modeling for that was just too complex. <laughs> so they actually dropped it in favor of just looking at carbon. Um, so I think it's really important to recognize that, that um, even with all the complexities of all the work that the people around this table um, are doing, we also have to look at all the knock-on effects on all the systems um, which are um, inter-independent, interconnected uh, with the systems we're working with. The, the, the specific point I wanted to, to make though is just to raise awareness of uh, this concept of risk homeostasis, um, which is that when as human beings, uh, we believe that risk levels are lowered um, in a particular context, and this has been studied, and it's not uncontroversial, but it's been studied, for example, in road safety, we tend to adjust our behaviours to get back to the same risk levels that we were at previously. So I think that's a really important issue to think about in terms of the broader messaging about carbon capture um, and how we're actually um, managing support for the changes that are required not just in the short term, which is obviously urgent and, and, and a priority, but over a longer period of time. Thank you, Benjamin. Um, I'm just looking at the questions we have. So there's one that's maybe a bit more for Kim, but maybe others can also chime in. So it's about CCS uh, being a bit centralized because of the nature of the coastal injection, I guess. Do you think in the future there could be a way to do it locally? So uh, connected directly to a factory or uh, even a home to store or inject CO2 or perhaps uh, transport it using pipe pipelines other than ships? Because we also know that ships can uh, emit a lot of CO2 in the transport. So do you envision a possibility for a, a pipeline in Europe that can connect the factories directly, for example, because I think also uh, localizing the, the capture could have other effects on society. And this is just my thinking right now. If we could eventually move factories closer to cities, for example, by avoiding the pollution they cause, it could have a positive impact uh, due to the society interacting more with the factories and knowing the impacts and seeing it with their own eyes instead of being farther away. So there's a lot of network, network effects and system effects that can be had. So I'd like your opinion on this. Okay, well, um, uh, let me start with um, 
uh, with with the first question related to to pipelines instead of uh, uh, ship transportation. You know, it, uh, ideally, yes. Um, uh, the the challenge with pipelines is that they're very expensive to lay, and there need to be a market. Uh, for these services before anyone is willing to invest in expensive pipeline infrastructure between uh, uh, European emitters and uh, the, the, the storage capacity uh, uh, that is being developed. Um, but I, I believe that we will see that. And uh, uh, I think I mentioned earlier as well that uh, there, there are uh, currently companies that are looking at uh, development of a pipeline uh, holding capacity of between 20 and 40 million tons of CO2 per annum uh, between Belgium and uh, Norway. So, um, yes, there is uh, some work ongoing there. In terms of uh, storing CO2 close to the where the emissions actually are, well, you need the right geological conditions in order to be able to store CO2. And uh, uh, those geological conditions uh, are mainly found in the North Sea Basin area. Uh, and also there would be public resistance, and we've seen that in the past against storing CO2 uh, on shore in, in many countries. Uh, and we've seen that in particular in Germany, um, but also elsewhere in the Netherlands, for example. So uh, I, I don't believe that uh, that we will be able to, 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 to kind of gain public acceptance for onshore storage of CO2 anytime soon. Uh, therefore, uh, offshore storage is, is what is being developed and what is being looked at. Uh, in the Netherlands, there is a project called Portos that is being developed, uh, which will take CO2 from industrial emitters in the Rotterdam Harbor area, uh, take it offshore through a pipeline and inject it uh, uh, in a depleted oil and gas field. Uh, and that development is ongoing. Uh, so uh, there they don't need ship transportation. Uh, and, and we could see similar, or we know that there are similar projects being developed also in the UK. Uh, and, and possibly also elsewhere. At the same, so the, the ship-based solution is to kind of provide flexibility and to give access or make CCS an alternative for industries that are not close to storage capacity. Then for us, what we uh, have done, because we are aware that uh, uh, ship transportation is is uh, uh, not, um, uh, you know, it, it, it causes a lot of, of emissions in itself, so therefore, we um, uh, have looked for, for the best possible uh, technologies for our ships. Um, uh, they're going to run on LNG, um, but we will also have a wind-assisted propulsion system uh, and air lubrication, which altogether reduces emissions with about 34% compared to conventional systems. Uh, so that's, uh, that's at least something. But we are also looking at zero emission um, uh, technologies for, for ship technology. So um, uh, hydrogen and ammonia uh, are probably the, the most likely ones right now. I'll, I'll leave the, the uh, uh, systems thinking uh, related question to, to, to others who are uh, better at answering that than me. Thank you, Kim. Um, I don't know if any of the others want to comment. Otherwise, I'll move to another question. Sorry, I, I missed, there's mention of a systems thinking question and my apologies, I must have missed that if there was one. I'd love to try and answer it if, uh, if I can. Uh, the question was uh, if it was more, well, I think Kim didn't answer that part about possibility of doing the capture, uh, localizing the capture basically and doing it directly uh, close to a factory. I guess if you had a pipeline that would be possible. So it was more like a, a thought than a question, I guess it was about uh, the possibility of localizing factories closer to cities because avoiding the pollution by capturing it could have an effect um, on several systems such as people being able to to see the impact that right. the factory has and participate more such as worker-owned factories where the society gets more involved and that could in turn reduce the consumption if people have a, a more visibility over the production processes etc I mean, there is something just interesting about that point, isn't there? We're talking about very deep sea, um, about large scale, invisible industrial engineering. We're talking about unpopulated um, uh, parts of the permafrost. Um, and um, it's really interesting. I'd love to ask my fellow panelists 
um, there's, there's something very convenient about that, very out of sight, out of mind, um, which would um, very much lend itself to the technocratic, you know, the, these geniuses are saving us from, from, from this, uh, uh, this um, uh, existential threat. Um, and we can go about our daily business without even thinking about it. Um, so, so I find it quite intriguing the point that Tiago makes about um, if if carbon capture was a part of the um, overall carbon reduction thing that was part of the urban infrastructure that was visible that was part of our lives, it would have a different sensitizing effect on our on our awareness, wouldn't it? Um, uh, and I, I, it's just it's just an interesting flavor that uh, that that what you're talking about is all quite distinct from um human location now i wonder if there are things that we need to do to raise awareness uh, of this kind of thing well if, if i may just um, uh, say a few words about that because uh, in in rotterdam for example which is a very populated uh, area in and you know both um, yeah around the, the uh, rotterdam harbor um uh, the industrial activities are going to be decarbonized that's not going to be seen but co2 is not visible right so that's uh, um, that's a thing here but it uh, obviously some of the infrastructure will be visible uh, and i'm sure that the, the neighbors will be very happy uh, to know that uh, uh, that uh, they are reducing the overall emissions from these industrial facilities uh, so so there it's going to be visible as such as an example. Thank you, Kim. Yeah, right. So, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. Right. Along those lines, I think there's an opportunity here. I mean, we'll need nature based solutions, we'll need carbon capture and sequestration. Understanding the magnitude of, um, you know, 40 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent being emitted each year, not to mention the methane and all the rest, is a profound challenge for us to actually get a hold of. And I think an equally large challenge is for us to draw down a significant fraction of our historic carbon emissions in a few decades, which is somewhat unparalleled given that we spent almost 200 years emitting it. Um, and part of it is that, yes, we will need some centralized CCS, I'm sure. Um, but you know, the, the thinking that got us into this situation, that there's some, famous person who said, you know, you've got to use different thinking to get out of the problem. And I think we have an opportunity to move towards more um, integrative design and integrative um, system engineering, if you will, to actually work our way out of the challenges that um, have gotten us here. I mean, um, capitalism is very good at reductionist point solutions, whether it's capital or carbon reduction by itself. But now we've got in multiple integrated challenges. Paul has articulated so well the fact that um, you know if we don't keep the permafrost frozen, a lot of those 1,600 gigatons of carbon translate to, let's say, um, 4,000 gigatons or maybe 5,000 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And then go ahead and multiply that by 80 because most of it's going into methane. And um, that's the greenhouse gas ratio of methane to carbon dioxide. So who on this planet wants a um, runaway <laughs> feedback loop that's 80 times um, more challenging than what we've seen already? Uh, that's just really, uh, that's a planet that clearly our civilization isn't gonna be um, sustaining itself on. So we've gotta keep the permafrost frozen, perhaps equally or even more um, concerning is the marine permafrost sitting off the Siberian Sea, where we've seen already giant bubbles of methane popping, you know, bu bubbling up from the seafloor? Because guess what? Those shallow seas no longer are covered by sea ice. The albedo has gone from 80% reflection to 20% reflection. That the, the North Pole gets more sunlight in the summer than the equator. That's how intense the sunlight is. And that warming of that top layer is just heating up the layer of water melting that permafrost on the seafloor and causing enormous potential release. You know, the ominous thing about the methane increases that we're seeing in the atmosphere now is that they have a different isotopic ratio indicating a natural source. So, you know, we kind of flattened out on methane uh, in around 2010, and then it just started taking off again. And it's like, wow, what's causing that? And you look at the isotope ratios 
and you find out it's not coming from fossil oil and gas. It's coming from natural um, biogenic sources of methane, which is scarily taking a super linear curve, could be an exponential curve. And you know, are we seeing the beginning of this? You know, in 2014, they found the first Siberian um, methane pit crater. It was about 60 meters in diameter and a 60 meters deep. And you know you can track the number that they've seen each each year, and by the doubling time is one to two years, and this is an exponential curve. I'm sure Paul can tell us more about these, but these are massive, explosive craters where you've got methane trapped under the permafrost. It builds up in pressure so much that it just explodes, and they thought somebody had <laughs> thrown off a nuclear weapon. You know that's how how bad it sounded in the nearby settlement. And so, um, you know, you're looking at an exponential increasing number of pit craters showing up in Siberia from these um, methane outbursts. And that's just on land. You know, you've got as much or more marine permafrost than uh, terrestrial permafrost. So it's a major concern. All this to say, we've got to come up with some integrated solutions to keep the wheels on the train. And literally, this is a bet your civilization proposition. And the question is, can we partner with companies like Shell to enable nature-based solutions and CCS as fast as we possibly can. Because if we don't see an exponential increase in the scaling, <clears throat> and literally we're tracing a dozen years to a gigaton and then more sustainable levels from there. Um, you know, if we don't get this right, uh, civilization's going down. So we've got to move quickly. Um, so enough said, but Paul probably has more to add on the permafrost side. Yeah, thank you so much, Brian. I completely agree with you there. And especially there with, um, with the marine permafrost, as you mentioned, uh, when I talk about the number um, 1,600 um, gigatons of carbon, I always exclude the uh, marine permafrost because we have not really uh, measured it yet what is carbon and counted it. So you can estimate it. I don't want to say it, but you can estimate it around 2,000 gigatons. It's just an estimation of mine. So don't compare it. But it's obviously way more than this, just these 1,600 gigatons. Brian, you mentioned it, it either can go out as CO2, probably not. It will probably release as methane, which is way more dangerous, um, as Brian mentioned. So this is a huge problem. And as Brian always mentioned, this feedback loop was really this problem. We get more and more greenhouse gases out of the permafrost. It accelerates global warming. Permafrost gets even harder, even more um, CO2 or methane is coming out. And this cycle is accelerating in a really unpredictable way, in a really fast way. So it's on us now to act now and not act in, in 50 years when we see, oh no, no permafrost is melting in a really fast rate. And I feel like then it's probably quite too late to say, um, now we can act and um, we have to act now, we have to act proactively and not just um, in regards, now we see a problem and now we have to do something. But I also wanted to mention, um, also with you, Benjamin, um, you talked about um, about uh, CO2 carbon capture um, around urban cities and um, CO2 or in general and um, more sustainably around urban cities. I feel like there's a really awesome approach um, that we use way more, um, so way more to near to the people, to way more to urban cities that we show them approaches really work. We can also use nature-based solutions um, in urban cities to show them how much biodiversity is really a benefit for the humanity show them other benefits of biodiversity, like um, good livelihood, good water, um, in general, better air, cooler cities and stuff like this. This also helps to just get more awareness surrounding um, these solutions. Here now in this panel, obviously, a lot of experts are here and we obviously know about uh, nature-based solutions. Most of them, when I talk to, um, talked about um, animals and biodiversity in general, it's more like an ethical thing. It's like we have to keep the animals safe because they are obviously um, uh, obviously have to live somewhere and obviously have to be happy somewhere. That's obviously a great approach, but we always forget these uh, um, ecosystem services that biodiversity provides for us. And I think it's important to show people um, what is really a service that biodiversity brings us. Then it should be very more easier to translate it to an obviously a scaled up solution for permafrost, for marine, perma, for marine cultures. It should be way easier to do this when it's in the mind of the people and not just um, anywhere around.
So it's yeah. So there's a question from Prakash. Uh, considering that every solution should be considered and tested, I guess is there are you aware of studies comparing nature-based solutions and and CSS in terms of costs or benefits and risks, scalability, etc. Or there's still a lot of work to do in that area. We have a number of methodologies that are being developed for marine drawdown and uh, and other approaches uh, on land. There's been biochar methodologies developed recently. Uh, I think the methodologies are a good starting point because they describe uh, route approaches that have been peer reviewed that enable um, that, that enable the the sinking of carbon or the burying of carbon. Uh, in a way that um, has um, understandable effects and manageable side effects. So I think that methodology development is a good approach. Uh, it does take some time and effort and energy, but that's one way to, to look at this. Um, we're in a century of triage in the sense that any fixation of gigaton could potentially have some side effects or costs. And um, we need to uh, collectively um, go through and, and evaluate those. And you know, we're going to need many wedges of a gigaton or more in order to get back to a healthy climate. And that um, will require uh, some really careful analysis and, and really trying at small scale many approaches and then scaling those that can be done uh, cost effectively and with manageable side effects. Paul, you wanted to also say something? I think Kim was first. No, oh, sorry, Kim. I didn't see. Kim, go ahead. Kim, uh, you are muted. I can unmute you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I got a message saying that uh, the host had to unmute me. I couldn't do it myself. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to say that uh, the, the European Commission is, uh, is, is going to launch the CDR directive later this year. Uh, the uh, CDR, uh, basically com carbon dioxide removals, it's going to include uh, all type of removals. Uh, and I think that will be a very important uh, uh, um, uh, uh, policy document that we should probably all uh, kind of try to understand and uh, uh, provide input uh, where that is needed. How are these different technologies going to be uh, looked at, measured? I know one of the things that, uh, that uh, the Commission is uh, uh, looking at is permanence. Uh, and uh, they're going to measure the different uh, technologies uh, also with that in mind. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm uh, not in a position to, 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 to uh, uh, kind of talk to Nature Best Solutions in, in great detail, but I, uh, I, I would say that um, uh, uh, there, there are uh, obviously uh, aspects related to permanence that, uh, that are very important and need to be considered there as well. And I'm sure that's on, on everyone's mind. Uh, and and only then I think will we be able to compare kind of the different technologies to each other uh, uh, also uh, uh, in relation to cost. Thank you, Kim. Uh, I see there's some discussion in the chat between Brian and Paul about uh, markets, biodiversity credits, etc. We had a, a session in the afternoon to discuss those topics, but we had to cancel it because the speaker had COVID. So maybe we can discuss a bit about that for the rest of the time. So if you want to talk a bit about what you think about carbon offsets, carbon credits, and in this case, these alternative biodiversity credits. There's a place for each of these. Uh, we're finding that uh, the market has a premium for actual carbon removals. 
And um, that's where we're, you know, effectively actively drawing down. And it those carbon removals will be in place and available even if after net zero, because you know, it's not commonly talked about, but you get to net zero and we really don't get to a stable climate. We we're gonna, you know, if, if we leveled out at two or two degrees of, of warming, uh, you know, we know that Paul knows that the permafrost is gonna keep melting. You know, you're like you're not gonna get a refrozen Arctic that way. And so um, for us to actually get to a stable climate, we're gonna have to be drawing down significant amounts of greenhouse gases. And so there is a premium on carbon removals. Offsets can help for the time being, uh, but I, I liked uh, Kim's slide where he showed, look, 90% of these emissions are abatable. They're actually, uh, they can be addressed. And then of course, there's the last 10%, which is the hardest. And that's where CCS really comes in. And then beyond that, uh, you know, I think we've got a huge opportunity to um, use nature's natural reservoirs in the deep ocean where what 38,000 gigatons of uh, carbon is stored in the middle of deep ocean stably today uh, and using those, even though they nominally just have a few century timescale, um, you know, nothing in nature is absolutely permanent. So it's a matter of time scale. And the United Nations has indicated that a century, at least for the, for the clean development mechanism, a century time scale is suitable because a century from now we're going to have likely quite different problems than we have in this century. So just a few comments. I'd, I'd like to make a point again from from a systems perspective, I, and it's one of these comments that you will often hear from that perspective that may not necessarily be be helpful. Um, I, 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 it relates to to the point um, that that you made earlier about. Um, uh, capitalism is very good at point solutions that don't take side effects um, in, into account. Um, and I work uh, a lot of the time in public services in the UK, and we now have all the committees of our parliament and our national audit office making the point that um, you should probably never enter into outcomes-based contracts for public services. Um, and the reason for that is that an outcomes focus is um, uh, a great way of reducing um, the number of things that you think about in delivering a contract. Um, and people then do focus on the outcome. And of course, uh, there are a number of ways to do that, including lying, um, gaming the system, but principally focusing on the outcome at the cost of um, uh, side effects, second order effects, um, and, uh, and, and so on. And so just fundamentally, even though I'm a huge fan of um, carbon accounting uh, effectively, carbon tax, carbon credits, carbon trading, however that is, is surfaced, um, the financialization, the monetization, particularly of biodiversity, um, raises real warning flags. Um, and so I, I don't know what the answer to this is, but of course, what we know is that in a system geared for optimization at, at, at any, exp any other expense, what will happen is people will optimize and game uh, the system in order to um, tick the box. It's why I have a fundamental um, problem with, this, with the oversimplification of the sustainable development goals and the, the lack of in interconnection between them. Um, so I guess I'll stop there because I've seen some nodding and there'll hopefully be some helpful comments from, from colleagues on the, on, on the panel. Um, I hate to raise these things without, without um, a, an answer, but that's the concern is that as soon as we financialize, people will achieve those financial goals, which may contribute to biodiversity, but it will likely do so in, in, in a way that doesn't optimize um, holistically for biodiversity, but optimizes for return on investment. Thank you, Benjamin. Actually, I think introducing questions without an answer is a good thing. And it's something you like to do too. So thank you for your contribution. Yeah. Paul? And Benjamin, I quite agree with you. Maybe I can explain why the biodiversity credit is so interesting for us, or the general and the um, carbon credits are interesting for us. 
or Brian, you mentioned for all the SDGs, um, some in sort of incentives, some sort of market would be interesting. And the reason being is right now, how do we finance our project? It's through some grants, it's some through public funding, and it's some donations from maybe a company, maybe from private persons. That's it. That's not really a um, sustainable revenue ch um, chain that we can create there. So we have to do, we have to basically um, sell some sort of product. And this product for us would be the biodiversity credit that we have to create. And what is important there that we always have to keep in mind um, when we're creating credits, that there are some sort of restrictions. You can't obviously just buy some sort of area and plant, I don't know, reintroduce some animals, and then you sell some credits out of it. That wouldn't work. You have to do some additionally. It has to be permanent, as Kim mentioned beforehand. It has to be measurable. So all these criteria are really important when creating um, credits. And I feel like when it's under a really good standard, under a really good regulation, the credit itself, it should be a um, good way for, first of all, to sustainable finance um, our project. And second of all, um, obviously, to scale up and the project, it's way easier if you have a methodology that says you have to do these kind of um, approaches um, in order to get a biodiversity credit out of Pleistocene rewilding. If you have this methodology, it's way easier to scale up um, the project itself because other people can use this methodology, other um, um, organizations can use this methodology, create their own um, biodiversity credit, and then scale up the project in a, um, I feel like in a sustainable way, but I completely agree with you, um, Benjamin, there, there are pro probably some sort of, yeah, some, some loophole or some something that's not right, and you can probably exploit the system pretty easily, it's about regulation, but not too much regulation that nothing fits into there. So it's quite hard to, how do you get a really good credit, how it's um, um, it may be done? And yeah, that's a, that's a tough question, I feel like. If I can just, just jump in there to, to just to amplify something. I think part of the question here is how you bring in expert discrimination in what counts as legitimately meeting the goals. Um, uh, and that's an, that's another eternal question uh, in in a sense because that will be subject to power plays and gaming as well. But nevertheless, it needs to be considered. Sorry, I just wanted to. Yeah. So this reminds me quite a bit of tragedy of the commons type problems, and it turns out the best example that I've seen of solving tragedy of the common problems, um, Eleanor Ostrom notwithstanding, is the uh, Chilean catch shares that were used for the sardine fisheries. What was interesting is uh, before the cat share system was implemented, it was really a terrible tragedy, the commons, where uh, there was a lot of overfishing. The se fishing seasons were narrower and narrower. The fishermen were competing with each other. You know, fishermen were dying. It was a very difficult and dangerous industry. And it was wiping out the sardine fishery terribly. Um, that was changed. And, you know, there was a sustainable catch that was ascertained each year on a Chilean, on a nationwide scale. And actually, each of the vessels was registered as to tonnage, and um, the, they each got a share based on tonnage that they could harvest anytime they wanted over a period of 10 months. But every time they came in, the, what ca the catch was going to be weighed, it was going to be counted against their system, and against their, their allocation, and that would be the, um, you know, an approach. Now, what's interesting is, by setting up that governance framework, they went, the fishermen went from being hunters to being um, stewards of the sea, because suddenly the incentive became, how do we make the catch bigger? And so suddenly these, there were uh, fishermen associations meeting every month to how do we keep the Japanese out or the Chinese out or the you know, X, Y, Z, or you know, uh, how do we manage the fishery better uh, so we can make the catch bigger and have a larger sustainable fishery next year? So it's really interesting turning competition into cooperation and I feel as though the role of government and the public-private public discussion should be focused on creating that environmental framework that enables a virtuous and collaborative and cooperative system to be facilitated. So I would look towards examples like the Chilean cat shares when it comes time to build SDG incentives and motivations in a public-private policy context. Thank you, Brian. Uh, I think also part of the issue that well, it's a bit more difficult to discuss 
is the, the impact that focusing only on climate change and Benjamin touched a bit on this and carbon can have on uh, basically enabling us to continue business as usual that has a lot more impact than climate change such as biodiversity loss, mental health issues and other kinds of interconnected issues that we are facing, facing as a species. And uh, this can be a bit of a distraction. So even the, the carbon, even though the carbon credits and offsets can help finance nature-based solutions, even that can have a side effect of not really focusing on reducing con consumption or other approaches that are more um, deep and long-lasting and, and make a real difference. So if you want to discuss a bit about that. Well, just I think one in one way, um, the the dividend that we be may be talking about, I, I'm wondering if a carbon dividend would be a rising tide where every uh, every adult resident of a country would be allocated a certain number of carbon dividends. And this would be something that could be revenue neutral even, but would enable market forces to be a rising tide to really accelerate, let's say, the economic incentives to move towards uh, lower carbon approaches. It's one of several strategies, of course, but I just wonder uh, how we can identify these uh, tragedies of the commons and then and then come up with approaches, whether it's carbon dividends or something else that can address them um, in a perhaps decentralized way. Interesting approach there, Brian, with the personal carbon credits there and most like a cap and trade system then, right? So if you have a certain um, number of credits that you can use, and maybe you, if you have don't use all of them, you might trade them like the big players in the industry. Yeah. And yeah, it's interesting. You know, we, we have seen collapses in markets from time to time. And I wonder, you know, for making multi-year or decadal capital decisions, if a, a predictable and rising price on carbon, uh, much as uh, Kim illustrated, you know, the, the expected price over the next decade. If that actually was simply put in place, I wonder if um, it would enable capital decisions to be taken earlier and more quickly. Yeah, yeah. What I wanted to add there, again, with the initial question from you, Tiago, um, I feel like we talked about a lot of, a lot of uh, scope, uh, a lot of big scope things right now with all these credits and stuff like this. And I feel like uh, still keep in mind the individual uh, system change or the individual change that we all have to do in some sort. And I feel like it's way easier just to say everyone has to change. Okay, but why would I change and why would I do it? And to create some sort of incentives like Brian suggests with this um, um, personal carbon um, credit that you do have is always a good way um, to create more awareness surrounding this. Um, we can... What, what I feel like is a great example there is um, veganism, actually. Um, people, some, some people started to be vegan, um, show their benefits out of it, show the benefits in general out of it, and other people um, got into it and uh, got vegan as, uh, vegan as well. So it's always, where do you kickstart um, this, this sort, of, uh, sort of change? And you have to be just kickstarted for some individuals, some innovators um, that can show what is, uh, why would it do it and why it's great. And then it should spread around um, society and it's, it's easier done. And obviously there have to be some incentives. No one has to really want to change really out of, out of, yeah, out of moral sometimes. It's really hard to get people there, but I feel like um, it's always important to keep the system change and individual change on the same side of the coin and to, to tackle both problems. That's a great point, Paul. And I think, um, you know, if we could make it fashionable to live a uh, low, lower carbon intensity lifestyle, that would be attractive. Um, maybe Tesla early on was, was a uh, incentive in that direction, but I think um, it's an interesting challenge and maybe, uh, you know, the people divulge a lot of information on social media, maybe, make it fashionable to uh, talk about how much they've reduced their carbon individually. Uh, and then of course, globally. And I think part of it is as we develop more carbon transparent products, you know, we see the potential with marine permaculture to eventually work through food, feed and fertilizer and a bunch of other bio chain, but uh, um, value chains that eventually get to the potential of developing bio crude that actually could reuse 
the midstream refining and downstream distribution of fuels that might be needed for long distance aviation or other uh, hard to abate uh, approaches. But then that pre presents the possibility of carbon negative biofuels in the future. And so uh, by uh, identifying this and accounting for it, uh, perhaps there's a way to um, make that more transparent. In a real sense, we as consumers, as individuals, can vote with our pocketbooks to buy products that are radically transparent and carbon negative uh, and really helpful for the environment. And so can we improve that radical transparency? Can we get to the point where products have 2D barcodes on them and you can dive as deep as you need to or want to to look at the sustainability of this product before you purchase it? Those are the kind of buying decisions that we could all make and we can vote with our feet. We can vote with our pocketbooks. And uh, the sooner we can accelerate that, the better perhaps. Again, the, the interesting question there is how you establish um, and build the trust of um, a trusted authority standing behind that, isn't it? Um, you know, I, 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 there was a great piece on um, Twitter this morning about um, recycling. Um, oh no, on LinkedIn, and somebody had gone to their um, local supermarket and, and bought a set of materials and invest uh, a set of shopping <laughs> um, and investigated the actual recyclability of, uh, of the claims um, and so on. Um, and things like uh, quite a lot of the sham of, of, uh, of plastic recycling, um, the variable standards of the certifications which are applied, the simple fact that all the good news is on the front of the packaging and all the bad news is on the back. Um, governments continuing to provide actual subsidies for um, you know, carbon producing uh, extractive industries and use of those kind of things. Those all undermine trust and take away a sense of individual agency um, in the process, don't they? So I think the, the more we can get um, consistent probably due to the nature of the problem global standards um that are actually that actually stand up to inspection um the more we're going to support that kind of process agreed yeah i i very much uh, agree with that as well uh, ben and, and and i think yeah building trust with the public is going to be crucial uh, and uh, uh, then we must also make it possible for consumers to make a decision so uh, certification measurement standards, et cetera, uh, will be very important. Uh, right now that doesn't exist, but it is under development. And I think uh, that is also something that the European Commission is looking at. Uh, there is the um, uh, uh, standardization uh, agency VERA, which is um, uh, developing uh, mechanisms for this, which I, I think uh, are good, um, but uh, uh, there is not one standard uh, that applies to, uh, to, 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 to the different markets uh, right now, and we need such a standard. And yeah, I mean, the beauty of standards is there's so many to choose from, but uh, whether it's the gold standard or uh, VERA or some of the national standards, um, they're, they have reasonably similar uh, methodologies. And I think um, by, by developing those and having some good third-party validators, uh, that can help to establish confidence in the market. Can, can I ask the panel, to what extent do, do you, do you, uh, you know, <laughs> what proportion of um, uh, straightforward leverage do you ascribe to individual consumer decisions compared to um, market decisions, government decisions, and so on? It's a very broad, non-systemic question. But you know, it, do, are my choices in uh, in, in shopping? which are already limited by what's in the supermarket supply chain, by what's local to me, um, by my ability to see through um, uh, claims or you know, lack of claims of, of, of carbon impact and so on. Are they meaningful? Well, with the power of social media these days, uh, you know, it's surprising how many elections are being swung by social media. So uh, you know, it's surprising if you've got a few thousand friends, you know, and you tell them about what you've been buying or not buying, uh, that can have a surprisingly strong influence. So I wouldn't underestimate um, the degree to which that is important. Um, I think we have to address it at individual scale and at corporate scale. And ultimately, you know, I think we have to recognize, uh, in spite of <laughs> efforts in the United States, um, we have to recognize that, you um, carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases represents a form of pollution 
and ultimately there'll have to be a price on that. And uh, that, you know, if, you know, there's an old saying in the, in the States, pay to pollute, and we're going to have to um, internalize those externalities sooner rather than later. Yeah, and it will be interesting to see um, uh, now on uh, on, on uh, some of the, the um, uh, industries that, uh, that we are working with uh, that are looking at uh, uh, carbon capture to, to reduce their emissions. Uh, I know some of them are, are looking at uh, uh, you know, ca can they charge a premium on, uh, you know, link to the cost of that climate technology uh, to uh, the, the cement that they're selling, for example, will people or governments be willing to pay that premium? Uh, uh, and, and how much it's going to be, I'm not sure, but I've heard someone saying that, you know, if, if you're building a house or, or uh, uh, then um, uh, the premium for actually using a kind of green or carbon neutral Cement, for example, is only going to be a couple of percent compared to the overall cost of building that house. Uh, same with a car. If you um, uh, uh, actually uh, know that the steel used to produce that car uh, is uh, carbon neutral, uh, that the cost of that is only going to be a couple of percent more. Um, and, and people may be willing to pay that. Um, uh, uh, in fact, I, I, I think I personally would. And uh, uh, But maybe we need... You know, to make it visible in one way or another. Uh, uh, as you said, Brian, uh, should it be a, a green sticker on the back of the car or, you know, uh, I don't know. But if you make it attractive, uh, maybe then it will happen to a larger degree. I think so. I mean, in California is a great example and they've led the United States in so many ways, but they had an energy star for refrigeration and literally California cut most of its energy electricity use uh, for refrigerators in just a few years and really led the way on uh, LED or fluorescent light bulbs. Uh, and so there are, you know, by making um, these invisible uh, ca embedded carbon factors visible, uh, I think that can go a long way uh, and ultimately enables people to do individual budgets, but then most importantly, getting to naturally nationally determined commitments uh, collectively um, is a key part of this and ultimately must be incentivized. So by making the invisible visible, I think we can go a long way towards uh, really transforming um, our civilization to something that becomes sustainable. Yeah, I agree there, uh, Brian. Um, and I wanted, wanted to add as well, I, I mentioned it in the, in the chat um, beforehand, um, some, to some sort of gamification. And what I mean by that is, um, obviously, we have to keep in mind that humans are really competitive um, and want to be better than their neighbor, want to be better than their friends, whatever it should be. And I feel like we could use this in a way that we show um, who got the most, I don't know, who got the most carbon um, reduced, who got the most um, carbon um, net profit there um, and show it in a way that's not in a way that we show them, oh, this person is better than me, but maybe show them, oh, this person does something that helps um, the environment in general. Because I feel like if you just show this person is better than me, he does more and he is uh, so, so he's so super, I feel like it's like the opposite um, is made there. And it's really like people say, okay, well, this guy is so annoying. I don't want to have to do anything with, uh, with this stuff. So it's hard to keep a balance between showing that you actually do something for nature and not going onto the nerves um, on other people. It's my general experience there. I rarely, I barely say that I'm working in the sustainable area because I don't want to get on the nerves of the people. They are so much in the news about it and there's so much uh, bad stuff in the news about it. So I keep always a balance there and keep it more on myself and don't want to be on everyone's head and say, ooh, you have to reduce your carbon um, profit and watch out, watch out. I think it's hard to balance between making an impact and getting other people to make an impact. I think that's quite hard and yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Paul. And moving towards aspirational products can do a lot in that direction. Uh, a great example of gamification were the previous, in the previous decades, you know, people had these frequent flyer miles, which are, you know, oh, great, you know, you can do free trips or whatever. But turns out, I mean, those, those, those frequent flyer miles actually represent huge amounts of carbon emissions, right? And so in a sense, you wanna turn it around. And I'm encouraged by conferences like these because you know, like it or not, from two years of pandemic, we have online conference technology. And I think we need to 
encourage people to so that 80% of the conferences they go to are going to be online for the foreseeable future. Uh, and you know, I, some people will have to travel sometimes, but if it's 80% less, you know, um, my friend Amory Lovins likes to say, uh, ship the electrons and leave the heavy nuclei at home. And that's effectively what we're doing with online conferences like these. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we are nearly finishing our time. So I will end with some thoughts and open questions uh, for the future. I was just thinking uh, everything that you just said about transparency, that the visualization helping to shape individual decisions is, is needed. Uh, at the same time, I'm just thinking that a lot of the power in, in the whole system comes from money currently, and, and profit is basically still the, the strongest motive for companies to operate and, and shape the, the decisions worldwide. So we probably need to think deeply also about how to make other kinds of goals other than profit, uh, the real goals of corporations and companies. Because that's where a lot of the decisions come from. So this is just food for thought. And I will pass the word to Benjamin, we will introduce uh, a workshop we will have in the afternoon to explore a bit more systems thinking uh, applied to to these kind of challenges like carbon capture. Thank you. Uh, That's great. Um, so from six to eight pm today, UK time, um, uh, I'll just be doing um, a bit of an introduction. Um, turns out that my fellow panelists uh, knew a lot about systems complexity in cybernetics already. I, I'm not surprised to hear it. Um, that means that participants might know a lot as well. Um, uh, so some of it might be teaching people to, to suck eggs. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be what people think of. Because these are such huge fields, uh, any of the words I've mentioned, systems change, systems leadership, systems thinking, mean many different things to different people. So I'll be trying to provide um, a little bit of an overview uh, in the time available um, and some tools that might be practical for people who are seeking to shift uh, systems, um, including systems convening, which is a, uh, a recent uh, book came out last year um, that has some very powerful stuff about people who are very situated in uh, uh, places and fields but work across boundaries and actually um, affect real kind of change in the world uh, which is the kind of thing we're uh, seeking. What would be really valuable to me is to know for anybody who's planning to come um, and I'll take comments any way I can um, in the chat now um, I'll, I'll drop my email in the chat um, uh, and even if people want to speak up now and, and uh, just say what would be most useful to you? What would you really, what, what questions do you have um, around systems thinking, systems change, uh, and so on? Thank you, Benjamin. So I'll just finish with a short introduction of Systems Change Alliance. We, we bring people together and organizations in helping to shape system change and how interconnected systems play together uh, in areas such as the environment, society, and the economy. So we look at uh, different fields and we, we try to interconnect them uh, with other fields and other ways of thinking. So we are facilitating these deep dives and the system thinking workshops to, to help in that. So thank you for coming. The recordings will be available for sale, but in this case, because there was some mix up with Zoom, we'll send them for free for those who attended. And thank you for attending. And have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.